Today on Turner Classic Movies, our afternoon... Simpson, welcome to Bravo Profiles. We met in 1964. I wanted to be a dancer. And I was singing with the White Rock Baptist Church. We started writing pop songs for fun. Pretty soon, we were writing songs for Ray Charles, Marvin Gaye, and Diana Ross. Around that same time, a small pioneering record company called Stax was causing a sensation in Memphis. Starting off in an old movie theater, it grew to be a musical movement with its own distinct sound and identity. Throughout the turbulent 60s, Stax was a constant hit factory, producing classic songs from a stable of celebrated artists, among them Otis Redding, Eddie Floyd, Sam and Dave, and our friend Isaac Hayes. This is a look at the soul of Stax on Bravo Profiles. <laughs> In the late 1950s, Jim Stewart, a bank employee in Memphis, Tennessee, and part-time country fiddler, begins to do some amateur recording in his garage. His sister, Estelle Axton, also excited at the idea of making records, mortgages her house in order to buy a recording console. She and her brother set up a makeshift studio in Brunswick, a suburb of Memphis. They've demolished the original building. Um, all the other buildings are pretty much the same. The, the area looks, looks almost the same. The homes and everything uh, hasn't changed that much. But I remember we were so close to the railroad track when the trains came by, we had to stop the corner. We, we didn't have a very well insulated building. Very quiet. It always was. We stayed out there, I guess, well, it was over a year. And we decided this is too far from talent. We need to go back into Memphis. At that particular time, movies, people weren't going to the movies anymore. Television had come in. So we thought, well, that would be a good thing to do. Take the theater and put a studio in there. So uh, that's, that's when we moved to Mike Lamore Avenue uh, in, in, uh, sometime during the year 1959, early 60. Uh, and we built the studio in what was known as the old Capitol Theater building. When we made that move, I think that was really the beginning of of what finally became known as Stax Records. I met Rufus Thomas, who was a DJ at that time. On Monday we have gravy and bread. 
On Tuesday, we have bread and gravy. On Wednesday, we have toast and gravy. Mm. That ain't a thing but bread. We kick to the landlord on Thursday. On Friday, we change, and he said. But when Saturday come around, we found out we had gravy without the bread. How you, you like that? Are you going to send me a copy of it? Huh? Are you going to send me a copy of it? Yeah, I'm going to send you a copy. Okay, be sure to put your address on it now. But why do I have to do that? So I know where to send it back to. <laughs> Yeah, put you out. <laughs> so, Jay, okay. I'm going to sort of take you back a little bit. Okay. I'm going to take you back a little bit. Okay. Some time ago, when Stax was in its heyday, no, not when it was in its heyday, when it was beginning to get into a heyday. Okay. You have to have a song to, to kick the uh, record company off. All right. You know, got to have that good record that finally hits and said, this is a hit, and they made money for it. Okay. Rufus and Carver came off the street, Walked into Stack Studio and said, "This is a song we like to record." We rehearsed it with the band. We rehearsed it with the band. And had such a song. We had. And we, we rehearsed it with the band, and the band played it. Good gracious of me, Rufus and Carla had the first hit for Stack, and this is the way it went. It was an instant uh, local hit, and this was in the summer, I believe about June, July of, of 1960, uh, and of course, uh, we uh, were approached uh, by Atlantic Records because the, the, the record had sold so much locally. So I went down to Memphis, and uh, I met with Jim Stewart of Stax Records, then known as Satellite Records, and we made an arrangement to produce, that is to press and to distribute the record. There was never a contract drawn up between Atlantic and Satellite at the time. Uh, we just worked on a handshake agreement between Jerry Wexler and myself that we got a record and we felt like we wanted to release it uh, nationally. We would just send the master to Atlantic and they released. Following these first hits by Rufus Thomas and his daughter Carla, other musicians find their way into the studio. Amongst them, William Bell. I knew Rufus, and Rufus uh, asked me and the group to do it, and we did the backup singing behind Carla Thomas, and that's what brought me to the attention originally with Stax Records, yeah. The Thomas family and I go way back because Rufus' son, Marvell, also, when I went solo, played a uh, keyboard on You Don't Miss Your Water, which was my first hit.
During the early 60s, um, Stax was kind of like a, a forerunner for the integration scene in Memphis. Um, <clears throat> and uh, we worked together basically as a unit and a group, but we weren't uh, too well received outside of the our little realm there because simply back then it was all segregated and black white just didn't really mix my sister Stell uh, had been selling records more or less out of the trunk of her car type of thing and uh, even before you know just to just to get some pocket money so she decided there was plenty of room in the lobby of the theater building to have a record shop all of the musicians and artists they come in and listen to records, and we talk about what makes this record sell. So that was uh, an experience for all of the writers and musicians. They wanted to make a record that would sell too. There were no charts, there were no arrangers. The band, that was the rhythm section, Booker T and the MGs, and we might as well name them. It was Steve Cropper on guitar, Duck Dunn, on bass, Al Jackson, a great, marvelous drummer, Petty Flea no longer with us, and of course Booker T, a trained and elegant piano player. The 60s, we ended up being a musical reflection for the neighborhood and the people somehow. We ended up uh, doing with our music what a lot of what the public was feeling. The feelings that we were playing, the soul that we were playing, the beats, everybody was relating to that. So we, we just were like a, a mirror. They could, they could hear us play and really relate to it. And, and somehow our timing was just, just good yeah, yeah. with that. Well, a lot of people told us, too, uh, that th they could always tell a Stax record. And it did, I guess, have an identity. Uh, I wasn't thinking of it in those terms. But uh, the public knew the difference. I don't know if it's a city. I don't know if it's a river. I think it's a lot of, a lot of it's to yeah. do with this city. Sure. Mm -hmm. I think that studio, uh, that old theater, the way it was designed with a slanted floor and, uh, you know, 25-foot ceilings and all, I guess had a lot to do with the overall sound of the record, you know. It, it was during 62 that the company, I think, really took off in many ways because Otis Redding walked into the studio in 1962. None of us knew that he was, like, the lead singer in Johnny Jenkins' band. We had no idea. I thought he was the driver and the guy helping with the equipment. <laughs> but anyway... Um, we finished the session, and Al came to me and said, uh, have you, can you take five minutes and listen to this guy saying he's been bugging me all day long for me to listen to him? And uh, I said, sure, go get him and let's listen to him. And uh, so he goes and gets this guy, and uh, the guy sits down and, uh, you know, some what key you know, get in B-flat and start playing some arpeggio. And he starts singing these arms of mine. And it's like the world stopped.
The studio musicians in Memphis were black and white. And I think that uh, by uh, the combination of the black background and the white background contributed to the uh, success of the uh, Memphis music and the new different sound that came out of Memphis, especially at Stax and especially at High Records. It was radical from a political point of view, but we were just people working together to make a living. And it was almost a hidden part of the community. The, 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 the politicians of the time did not recognize that that music was even happening. It's a long walk to D.C., but I got my walking shoes on. All the way to Washington. I can't take a plane, bus, or train, cause my money ain't that long. When I first came into Stacks, I was I was frightened, stiff, you know. I mean, here I'm in, in this place I've always wanted to be in, and all these giants have been through there. It was a it was a very loose atmosphere. It was not a rigid regimen of work. We worked up the arrangements around the piano and the drums. During those days, we were only recording on one track, so everybody had to rehearse and get all the parts down. The arrangements were all head arranging, mainly. There were very few written parts. We worked them up, and Otis did his stuff right there, man. He would, um, he had so much spontaneity. That was an Otis Redding answer. He said it, and he said, now you say it. That's, that's what the, happened in the studio. It happened in the studio. Y'all's turn. And we just played it naturally. Just follow him. Became just like part a, of the record. Just like having a good time. Spontaneous. And he'd say, can't turn you loose. He'd look at us and go, da 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 <laughs> And all that, da 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 all that stuff. da 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 He was great. We learned a lot from him. Otis didn't really write about himself very much. Um, but I would pick up stories from things that DJs would say. I mean, Mr. Pitiful came from WDIA radio station. Uh, I think uh, the disc jockey that, that pinned him, that was named Muha, and uh, he, he called him Mr. Pitiful because of the way he sang these, you know, crooning, sad, <laughs> you know, down on my knees, begging and pleading kind of ballads, you know. He started calling him Mr. Pitiful. And uh, I thought that was a great idea, and I was getting ready to go to work one morning in the shower, and I said, Mr. Pitiful, and I started humming this thing, and I, and I got so excited about it, you know. And um, I had to pick up Otis, and, and I couldn't wait to tell him about it. And uh, when I picked him up at the hotel, I told him about the idea, and he started beating on his leg in the car and all that. Da -da 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 -da, you know?
think there was a little shoe shine shop in between the grocery store and the actual uh, theater itself, the Maximal Theater. And uh, like most of the theaters that had marquees, you had an, an in and an out, you know, an entrance and an exit with double doors. And the first set of double doors on the right was the entrance to the record shop, satellite record shop. And uh, the left doors was the entrance in, into the studio itself, uh, the Stacks offices. Probably Otis Redding and the people sing probably in this area right in here. Uh, this area right in here was sort of all open. And the first thing you saw uh, originally was John, uh, Al Jackson's drum riser. For me, it was, it was like going to church every day. I mean, it had, he walked in those doors of stacks. He left everything out there behind you. sixties and so forth, we did have a family. It was a family starting off with Jim Stewart and Extel, Extel Axton, Stacks, the name came from that. But we were like family because um, we started off from scratch. They had already started before I came there, but I was brought into the family. Around 1964, Isaac Hayes is starting to make his name as an arranger and composer. He teams up with the lyricist David Porter and real success comes when Jerry Wexler of Atlantic Records brings to Stax an explosive duo named Sam and Dave. A lot of ideas and titles came from the church. And this title itself came from a gospel tune. Uh, you don't know like I know what the Lord has done for me. I don't know. It, it's different versions in different churches, you know. It's gospel, but it's like... It's like can make you feel good and do things for you, why can't a woman do the same thing too? So you don't look like I know what, what, this, what, this, you know, what this woman had done for me, so I thought about it for Sam and Dave. So um, we went to the studio and started working this thing up. That's the end line. The first line was...
1965, the black urban ghettos explode. As chance would have it, a Stax Review plays a concert in Watts, Los Angeles, at the time of the riots. I remember it being a fun show and all that, and, and the, the ironic thing about it is that um, about halfway through the show, these people started lighting matches and lighting their lighters and going, burn, baby, burn. Are we burning? And burn, baby, burn. Well, all right then. One, a two, a one, two, go ahead. that particular time, we needed a strong black uh, individual there that was more focused on the black community and black music. In 1965, Al Bell, a disc jockey and friend of Jim Stewart, is taken on as promotion man at Stax Records. There was a good deal of hope and excitement that Al Bell could maybe become the messiah, if you will, and come in and get a lot of product played and, and, and get Stack's momentum rolling. I don't want to imply or project a notion that says that it was a utopian kind of situation. We had our problems. We fought, but we were bonded. We were bonded because of our belief. And our belief was, and we were all on one accord with respect to that, was that we could cause our music to become the music of the world. We felt that way. In the mid-1960s, Stax music is being played more and more in the United States, and especially abroad. In the spring of 1967, a group of Stax recording artists sets off to tour Europe. Amongst them, Booker T and the MGs, Otis Redding, Eddie Floyd, and Sam and Dave. I thought that would probably be the end of it. That might signal the end. The big Stax thing went to Europe and toured and came home and poof, over. But. We got to Europe, it was anything but poof. It was getting down in boogie time in Europe. It was the big time the Beatles sent their limo to pick us up, sent the limos to pick up the band. And that was really a big deal, you know. And we thought, hell, we're stars. We didn't know we were yeah. stars. We thought we were kids working at the, the club to make enough money to pay the rent and making records and, you know, by getting by. But Otis would top it every night. He would top it. He it was top unbelievable. It. What a show. Oh, my, my. Uh, I know she's waiting. Just and just I'm painting. A thing that she'll never, never, never possess. No, no. But while she's there waiting.
When we came back home from the uh, Stax vote review and went to Monterey, it was, it was another version of the same deal. It was basically the first rock festival, you could say. The gathering of people to go hear bands and, and their idols and all that. And we felt very lucky that we were even on that show. Something new was happening culturally and music, musically in the United States. There's a, there's a new feeling, there's a new... There was, the policemen were gone, the Hell's Angels were running. We, we were led into the concert by Hell's Angels. They were protecting us. Mm -hmm. Us and our mohair green suits and everybody else in there. <laughs> yeah. Flower power. Yeah, and their right. paisleys and the early tie-dye stuff and all that. Everybody was smoking grass but us. I think we kind of listened to each other. And I've been loving you too long. Well, he says, can you do that one more time now? That was not planned. <laughs> that had, you know, when he did that, it, it blew me away. Can you do that one more time now? Just like ready for, you know, the death of anyone close to you, or a family member or an associate. But a tragic death like that, and especially at the, the time it occurred and uh, what he meant to us, when I say us, the company, as, uh, as a person and as an artist, uh, it's very hard to describe. And, and uh, it's a shock that you can never really recoup from. I don't, the company never really rebounded from his death. Sitting in the morning sun I'll be sitting in the evening sun Watching the ships roll in Then I watch them roll away again yeah. Sitting on the dock Watching the Three months after the death of Otis Redding, another tragedy. Dr. Martin Luther King is assassinated in Memphis. At the time of Dr. King's assassination, I was in the recording studio recording a song that, that had been written by Booker T of Booker T and the MGs, Eddie Floyd and myself, one titled Send Peace and Harmony Home. We wrote that song in got a young lady, Shirley Walton, went in the studio to record it on Shirley, and we had we did the track, and we were back over dubbing Shirley's voice, and, and for some reason or another, she couldn't really get into the song. I mean, she, she, she sang it, but it, it just wasn't there. And at a point in time, someone opened the studio day and door and said, uh, Dr. King was just shot and killed. And at that time, the tape was rolling. And Shirley started to sing. And, well, if you heard a performance, then you know what you are hearing. caused African-American people in the community to react negatively toward the European-American or the white people that worked for Stax Records. What had been the soul era on the high road suddenly seemed to grind to a shuddering halt. Uh, there was frustration, there was rage, and but Worst of all, the spirit seemed to have gone out of this particular movement in rhythm and blues music.
to protest within the company to get more uh, more black involvement in the managerial end of the company in the, in, the, in the executive part if this company it makes money predominantly on the black american market then i think it should be true all the way through i remember in detroit I saw on a news flash where they were burning and the only way the buildings weren't burned People write soul on the buildings, you know, and the big thing was soul brother. So I said, now, why not do something called soul man? In 1968, Stax breaks from Atlantic Records. Jim Stewart discovers that contractually, Atlantic owns the rights to all his master tapes. Stax is sold and becomes a branch of Gulf and Western. Having made the deal with Gulf and Western and, and being this new independent company, and having lost all of our catalog and everything, there was a need now if we were going to be an independent company, based on what Milt Gabler had taught me, was I had to have a catalog. So we decided, okay, we're gonna have a, we're gonna get us a catalog real quick. We're gonna go and record us a catalog. That's what we're going to do, said Al Bell. And I said, hey, what about me? I said, can I do an album? He said, yeah. I said, can I do it the way that I want it? He said, you got carte blanche, however you want to do it. And that's how I was afforded to do Hot Buttered Soul the way that I wanted to. I had the artistic freedom to do that. And when it came out, man, it was a smash probably was the first gold or and platinum album on a black artist at that time in the industry and I think the forerunner of the gold and platinum records and of course Isaac went on to enjoy numerous gold and platinum and multi-platinum albums after that at a time when they said that that kind of sales volume could not be achieved by black artists. For want of a, of, of a better word, things began to cut loose. Uh, the, the many of the disciplines that were imposed because of circumstances, they had stacks changed. 
Don Davis had been a producer and a guitar player at Motown. So we called upon Don Davis and Isaac Hayes and all of the other producers, and we started recording albums in Detroit, in Muscle Shoals, Alabama, in Memphis, Tennessee, and all over the place. Here we'd spent eight, nine years building something, and all of a sudden we saw it slipping away from us. Uh, the company was trying to get too big, too quick, coming up with all these album concepts and all this stuff, and it was just too much for us to do, so they said, okay, we'll farm it out to somebody else. Yeah. Jim really wanted me to stay, and I understand that, uh, but Al Bell said, look, if he's really not gonna be happy here, then, you know, let him go, so I left. Jim Stewart and Al Bell reacquire Stacks as equal co-owners. In Chicago, a young minister, Jesse Jackson, is leading a campaign named Operation Breadbasket. We began to confront these chain stores who would not let black products, goods, and services be put on their shelves. Chain stores that would not have black clerks and produce managers even in the ghetto. Chain stores that would not allow uh, black advertising in the shared advertising uh, program. Chain stores that would not allow black to build those stores. And so Bread Basket began to confront these chains, indeed to picket and boycott them. I may be unemployed, but I I may be in jail, but I am somebody. I may be poor, but I am somebody. I am beautiful. I am to be respected and protected. I am God's child. Jackson and I became very close friends and told me on one occasion while I was there he was he was ill and I had gone into Chicago to visit him and he said to me you know mate uh, you're spending too much time with that bald head rascal he was talking about Isaac Hayes and, and, and not enough time with Mavis now and he was talking about Mavis and the staple singers so every Saturday the staple singers would go over to Operation Breadbasket and open it up for them because we wanted to bring the people in that people didn't really know country preacher and uh we would go when, when they heard well the staple singers are going to be singing at operation bread basket then that brought the people in and uh it was like we introduced the chicago people to reverend jesse jackson yeah the staple family uh, whose gospel records in the mid 50s and 60s had been a great source of inspiration they were in this transition do you leave the gospel and say go to rock, or go to rhythm and blues, and the staple family, because it's a rhythm and religion, couldn't quite go that far. The idea of, of trying to, uh, to lift gospel music to a kind of crossover. Jazz stands, it, it seemed that times were getting better as far as us coming together. We said, well, we can move out of these protest songs and move into what we call message songs, which was the early 70s by now, and we came in to respect yourself.
was approached by Al Bell, who had spoken to some people at MGM. They wanted to target the black movie-going audience because um, Hollywood was in trouble. And they wanted to come up with something as well. Let's let's do a, a, a write a movie about a black hero, a black leading man, a black director, a black composer, all that involved in film. And they chose me as the composer. Who's the captain? Won't walk up with the danger all about. Shaft. Right on. They say this cat Shaft is a bad mother. Shut your mouth. Tell my chef, then we can be. He's a complicated man, and no one understands him but his woman. God, chef. Isaac was so big, and they had a group of security people there in the studio from New York, a couple of them, Johnny Baylor and Dino. Or from New York City. And when they came to Stax, they initiated some strong arm tactics. Uh, there were just myriads of people hanging around all the time that had nothing to do with the music, nothing to do with the Stax family. And the feelings of warmth and love and, and excitement that we had always had there were gone, just like smoke in the wind. There was a guy who worked for me in my security named Dino. Dino was a boxer, you know, boom, we used to work with Sugar Ray and stuff. So there's a man, say, look at those people out there. So do you know what you bring into their lives? You like a Moses, man. You just like Moses, man. You like black Moses. You the modern day Moses. I said, come on, Dino, don't look Yes, you are, man. And it raised the level of black consciousness in the States. I mean, people were proud to be black. They were proud, blah, blah, blah. Black men can finally stand up and be men, because here's Moses. Uh, he's the epitome of black masculinity. Chains that once represented bondage and slavery now can be a, a sign of power and strength and sexuality. What we did in August of 1972 was come to Southern California, rent the stadium that, 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 that held 100,000 people, brought our entire roster of artists out, and put a festival on. So it was a major fundraiser where we were putting back into the community, and it popularized our artists also, the living word. What stacks? It's the day of black people taking care of black people's business. Today, we are together. We are unified and on one accord. When we are together, we got power and we can make decisions. Today on this program, you will hear gospel and rhythm and blues and jazz. All those are just labels. We know that music is music. All of our people got a soul. Our experience determines the texture, the taste, and the sound of our soul. We say that we may be in the slum, but the slum is not in us. We may be in prison, but the prison is not in us. In what we have shifted from Burn, baby, burn, to learn, baby, learn. People got up and danced if they felt like it. They yelled and screamed, whatever they did, and there was no violence. It was really, really beautiful. It lasted for hours and hours, and I mean, over 100,000 people. Um, I remember one time they had a chicken wire that fence up, and Rufus said, when he did this fucking chicken, and one of the lines of the is, come on down, or something like that, and people jumped down and was trying to get over the fences, but it was, it was okay. <laughs>
finally victory, the Stax music now was being heard all across America. We desired to expand our sales potential as it relates to albums. What we did was we negotiated the first distribution deal we could distribute our product through CBS branches because Stax product going through those CBS branches automatically took CBS into the black marketplace and it took Stax into the Iraqs. To make a long story short, we ended up bringing an antitrust suit against CBS and, and sued them for $67 million for violation of the Sherman Padman antitrust laws for unfair trade practices, trade restraint, etc. For we alleged that, that CBS was attempting to put us out of business and to take over our company. After that, it was all financial problems and dealing with the bankruptcy courts and whatever, you know. Uh, but I went back into the studio, hopefully, to, to start some sort of a revival of, uh, of the company. Uh, the banks and all didn't had other things in mind that was not going to allow us to regroup and do that. So they shut us down. at Borders Books and Music or call 1-888-812-6656. I was crying. 